and gentlemen, welcome at the launch of Dance for Beirut. We are here in the beautiful Kromhout Hall in Amsterdam. A huge amount of organizations, institutions and people have come together because we believe in one and the same thing. That the performing arts matter, that they can make a difference. Horrible things have happened in Beirut. We have all heard about it in the news. What we discovered was that humanitarian aid, however important it is, of course, to help people, to get them their beds, to get them their water, but the performing arts didn't really benefit from that. Whilst they were the first ones to run out into the streets to go and help, to do what everybody else was doing whilst helping, but also with their added power of bringing people together. And that is why we're starting the dance for Beirut. A bunch of artists coming together to say, we appreciate what our fellow artists are doing there. We want to shout out to our audiences, to you, to support them. We're shouting out for a dance. We hope you will join with this dance. Today, we are going to talk first so we learn a little bit about the situation in Beirut from people who have the experience, from people who've worked there, from people who are there, and then we're going to slowly introduce it into a musical dance party. For now, I would like to welcome Alami Nabi, Janneke Rinsema, and still lurking in the shadows for now, we have Lucas Dols. Also online later on joining us is Ribal Al Rayes, all the way from New York, a producer. But let us first hear what the situation is actually like in Beirut. We've compiled a little video for you of artists who will tell you in their own words, in their own way, what the situation it is. We will be listening to the famous Lebanese actress from the film, The Secrets of Set Badiza, and I hope I pronounce it some a little bit right, uh, Nada Abu Farhat. We have Sandra Melhem and Zuhal from the Ego and Project House of Ego in Beirut, and we have Caroline Hatem. Listen to them. Performing the art is a message to oneself. A message that you feel the urge to pass on. Sometimes to praise yourself, another time to comfort yourself. But most of the time to help yourself rise up again and overcome all the obstacles you're facing that are holding you back. And you jump on help without even thinking that at the end it would change your life as well. When I started helping people after the Beirut blast, I wasn't thinking of art, nor about me being an actress or getting the exposure. All I could think of was people devastated by the explosion. Kids dying before the eyes of their mothers and fathers. About one kid calling out for his mom who was dead six hours before. About the elderly who managed to survive the collapsing walls covering the entire weak body. So I felt I wanted to help. I wanted to provide milk and diapers for babies, mattresses and pillows, hot meals, closing windows and doors for winter. But after three months of non-stop work, I got this urge to go on stage and perform, to put all my rage and downheartedness and tears into one beautiful, safe place, which is art. 
So I'm preparing my upcoming performing art project that is based on my personal experience with people and what happens in Beirut as, an, as a citizen, as an activist, and as an artist. My name is Nada Abu Farhad. Hi, I'm Sandra Milham, founder of Ego Beirut Project Beirut and house mother of the House of Ego. Hello, my name is Zahal. I'm a 26-year-old Lebanese drag queen and the drag daughter of Sandra from the House of Ego. About eight years ago, we began introducing drag shows as part of our weekly events at the club. And as a Lebanese drag queen, I do drag for self-expression, politics and comedy in my shows. Drag in itself is considered a form of activism. Drag queens have been at the forefront of the fight for LGBTQ rights throughout history. Uh, now, that uh, for the past three years, the ballroom scene as well as the drag scene in Beirut has, Beirut has been gaining rapid momentum. However, due to the coronavirus pandemic, the financial crisis that has hit the country, and the August 4th explosion, we are now left with our hands tied. Which led us to losing many opportunities during the corona lockdown and not being able to buy any material due to the financial crisis and not being able to perform at any place because we lost them after the explosion that happened on August 4th. We know that for most people, performing arts and entertainment in general is considered a luxury or a privilege. However, for a lot of us, this is our source of income and our source of living. We have a duty to continue fighting for our basic rights, and this, is, this, this art form and entertainment is one of the ways that, that we are able to gain awareness and visibility for LGBTQ rights in the region. So please, save Beirut, save the queer art, and save us. Thank you. Thank you. Performing arts allow people to meet around powerful works. Now, they were separated with the COVID-19 issue, and then came the explosion of August 4th that left everybody stuttering and feeling powerless and losing all sense. So it was important for me to direct uh, Les Justes by Albert Camus, The Righteous, about young revolutionaries with young people so that they feel that they play an active role through beauty, through art, through something that's bigger than themselves and feel powerful again. We're joined here with Ala Minawi. Ala, you are living in Amsterdam now. Yes. You come from Lebanon. You've made some amazing creations and installations here, but could you tell us what it's like for you to be living here now, whilst you know all the things that are going on there? Uh, it's, uh, it's very hard because um, Beirut is the place where I was born, I was raised, and all my experiences, and if I did good art uh, here in the Netherlands, it's because of that background that I come from. It's because of the people that I met and I learned from. And when that event happened, that was a big shock for, uh, for me. Actually, I didn't know what to do when I heard that. Uh, I slept. That's the, end, the only reaction that I was able to do for like two hours, and then I woke up, and then I started calling all my friends and my family and my friend because you bud, my body reacted like that. So that itself is something to say about, um, yeah, how, how I feel about what has happened. <clears throat> and how, what were the reactions of the people you were calling? What was the, what was the general feeling there? Everyone was in shock. Um, we didn't know what, I mean, the scale of it just started to show up a day after the other. And the, amount, like, the fact that everyone at the same time, collectively, a whole city, got destroyed uh, is something that you don't, no one experiences, you know, that everyone you know is hurt. Everyone that you know in your life, in your history, in your, in your street, in your whole life is hurt, including you. So there was a huge shock, trauma, silence, inability to talk about the subject matter, trying to find out who's safe, who's not, who's hurt and who's not. That was the main concern, at least for the first month. But a few days later, people started helping out somehow. Uh, they went on the streets, they started cleaning, they started... Uh, uh, they started helping somehow, yeah. And have you heard of initiatives now that uh, artists there are taking to actually help their friends, to help their neighbors? I think every single artist I know in, in my life for the past 14 years, they went to the streets and helped, everyone. 
there are lots of coalitions that had happened, lots of people who came together to start working. I, like, and everyone with their expertise, imagine like you use your theater expertise to actually help somehow. So scenographers started building doors and started making tables. Uh, actors who know how to deal with people went down and to, into people's houses and started helping them clean out, also at the same time help them talk about what has happened. Um, uh, everyone I know actually went down and helped somehow, yeah. And that's the beautiful thing to hear. Another person who um, has been setting up and doing things he can do is Ribal al Rayes, And I believe that we have him on a Zoom conversation listening to what is going on right here. Ribal, can you hear me? Hello, Ribal. Hey. Yes, I can hear you. Hello. Wonderful. Hello, we can hear you too, Ribal. It's fabulous that you can join us from uh, the, the New York, all the way there. Uh, you are a, a, a DJ, you're a producer, you uh, have set up a record label. You've also been doing things from, whether it's in Beirut or whether it is in New York where you are, to help uh, the, your friends, your colleagues, the people you know, and maybe those you don't know. Could you tell us a little bit more about that, please? Yes. Um, Thanks for having me. It's been very, it's been very tough uh, dealing with this situation, with this collective trauma. Uh, I recently got to New York, um, but I've been uh, doing a lot of work on ground and donating a lot of, uh, you know, materials uh, for the people that need it, donating money. Um, through my record label, uh, we created a year ago, actually, um, something called Beirut Bounce. It's a collection of uh, tracks from Lebanese artists and we sold it online and we've donated some of that money for the Beirut Art Fund uh, that has been uh, a sort of uh, collecting money to give uh, and help all of the artists that are, uh, you know, affected by this uh, through uh, Tune Fork uh, Studios with Fadi Tabal and a lot of people. So. Everyone came together with what they were doing already. For example, I had a record out. I switched the, the you know, from making the money for the record label to donating the money to everyone. And people are still donating their tracks and uh, helping out. Uh, so at the moment, I think we need to transpose working uh, with, the, uh, with our talents and, and artistic abilities to sort of political activism so we can really get some real results because what's ha what has happened is just, uh, it's too shocking, it's too painful to bear, too painful to bear. And we hear you there. Could you tell us a bit more about the, because we're also a at the ADE platform here now and uh, probably people watching, uh, some of them have been, I hope they've been to Beirut to experience the dance scene there. But could you tell us a little bit more? What was the dance and is the dance scene like there? It's uh, a lot of you have, have heard of, of the clubs and the, the dance scene in, in, in Beirut. At the moment, it's been reduced to rubble. It's very hard seeing it like this because a lot of uh, my colleagues and my mates have spent years building uh, the repertoire and the, and the network of their clubs, uh, clubs such as uh, uh, um, uh, Grand Factory and uh, clubs such as BO18 uh, and uh, uh, Uber House. Th these guys have been uh, around for a while. Uh, there's a recent club that just opened a couple of years ago and we had huge hopes for it because it was more of an underground club the Ballroom Blitz, which I was uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, playing there a lot as well. So all these clubs are amazing. The people behind them are amazing. Uh, it's at the moment, it's very sad. We, we're not able to, uh, to throw any parties. Uh, on top of COVID-19, uh, the whole blast basically decimated uh, some of these clubs. At the moment, it's non-existent. Some parties are happening, but you face, you, you face a situation where, you know, public safety is in question. Should you have a party, uh, some people are not, the, the, the divide and the sharp uh, 
um, sort of uh, contrast between the people that are making dollars and the people who make Lebanese lira, Lebanese pound, uh, is is very scary. So if you throw a party, who are you gonna who are you gonna invite? Uh, and and music is supposed to bring together. Some people are not able to actually secure funds for for food. Um, it's very sad. But uh, I don't want the people watching us right now to feel bad. I want them to feel angry because honestly, we've been robbed. We are a rich country with resources, and we had plenty of money. But it's just What's very hard is what we've, that, that we've been tricked by our own people, by our own politicians, which we don't think they're Lebanese anymore. They're out of this. We want them out. And I want people to help us get a, prominent, uh, a permanent solution to this. We don't, want, we don't want giveaways or money or anything. We want solutions. And I implore everyone to work. Uh, on top of them being amazing artists, I want them to be amazing activists as well, because this is what's going to get us out of this uh, situation. Here, here, thank you very much. Hang in there. Um, the, the, it might be possible if you hear something, don't hesitate to add in. Um, we're going to switch now to a Dutch person who has actually been to Beirut, worked there, and from a different scene than the dance scene, but at the same time, some similar experiences. Janneke Rinsema is known here in the Netherlands for uh, the, the, her own show. She's in a famous duo. She writes jokes for some of the most famous TV programs too. Um, and she was on a two month residency, actually investigating what is the role of humor and comedy in Beirut. Janneke. Hi. Hi. <laughs> what was your, your impression when you went to Beirut for the first time? Well, I think what a lot of people in Holland don't know is that in Lebanon there's a very limited freedom of speech. I didn't know that, not in that you know, capacity when I went there for the first time. And uh, the comedians there who are performing mostly underground, in the underground scene, they're very brave people. Um, it's, it's it's sensitive topics, for example, are uh, politics, uh, religion, um, sex, uh, being gay. Um, and I mean, these this is topics that in Holland we can't even imagine not being able to talk about. So what I wanted to know, I talked to many comedians, uh, journalists, theater makers, and we, we spoke about what comedy meant for them. And... Um, you know, the scene is very underground still, and stand-up comedy is a new art form in, um, in Lebanon. And it was just, you know, it was coming, it was, it was getting there, and now it's all gone. You know, the places where people were performing, where they were getting better, where they were bringing people together, people who were divided by religion, by, by politics, everything, it's all gone. So I feel... I mean, I feel I should, you know, talk to the Dutch people and tell them, you know, it's so important to support these artists who are struggling, um, not risking their lives only just by telling what their truth is, but just by, you know, living. And so that's, that's my message. And that is, ladies and gentlemen, what we are trying to do here, to do, a, again, a shout out, to open your eyes to the perspective of a different country, of a different city, of people who do something different. Even in the performing arts, we know this. Every different art form has their own kings and queens in the own sector. And what we're trying to do is to bring together this voice and say, we together, we stand for this freedom of speech, for this openness in attitude, in saying what you think and feel and finding a way of expressing that especially when you can then even tie it in to a social element. And for that, we also have Lucas Dols here with his face mask, keeping a safe distance. Lucas has set up Sounds of Change. Sounds of Change is an organization where they train uh, the local creatives and artists to work with uh, children in conflict areas. You've been to Beirut 24 times and not in the easiest of all places. That's right. Uh, I've been in uh, quite some different regions of, uh, of Lebanon, in the Afkar region, the Bekaa Valley, uh, in Beirut a lot. I've been working in Shatila a lot. 
And uh, since 2017, I traveled there for 24 times. It's quite a lot. Uh, and in the beginning, when I started working there, I trained a lot of musicians living in Beirut to uh, use their talents in the refugee camps. So how can they uh, use their, their musical skills in a different way than on stage? And it was amazing to see because, uh, because they are musicians, they have a very special um, thing going on compared to a teacher. Because a musician can create magic and can, can work with mm. children on future possibilities and look in the, to the future in a different way. So I think that's uh, very powerful. And I, I, I'm, still, I'm still in contact with many musicians in Beirut. And um, they are so keen to be active in the communities there. Which is very, and they also, because we also, we have this link with ADE, of course, you've come up with a way of introducing the sounds of the Middle East into, well, dance culture, basically. Can you tell us something yes, more um, about that? We, we did a, a collaboration between Massive Music and uh, Sounds of Change, our organization, and we've developed a, a sample pack and a VST, which is a digital instrument, a complete instrument, which, where you can use uh, instruments that you don't play yourself, but you can use it in a, in a MIDI keyboard, like uh, on, on your computer. Mm -hmm. And we thought, uh, what, what's missing? Mm -hmm. uh, we, why, why are not, where's, not, where's all these uh, Middle Eastern sounds in uh, the dance scene? And we thought, how about sampling them and making digital instruments about these uh, Middle Eastern sounds? And this is what we did with Massive Music together. And we've created a, a sample pack and a VST instrument um, with, from the Nai, the Arabic flute. Mm -hmm. the Nai, it's great sampled, actually. Uh, the Oud. Uh, we have the Rik and the Duff, the frame drum. And we have the Kanun, which is the Arabic harp. Uh, I mean, it, it sounds like a harp a bit, uh, like you have on that side. Um, and the DJs, they can actually use the samples, but they can also make their own melodies in their computer. So it's, and DJ uh, Kraut is yep. going to use it tonight. So you'll hear some of these. This is amazing. And I see on the screen, I see Rival smiling too. I think we should make sure that you get hold of this sample. I'll send you too. a link. <laughs> Just wondering, if it's, uh, is it out on the on the market? Uh, how can we get a hold of this? Yes, like it's called so it's called Instruments for Change, and you can find it on the website instrumentsforchange.nl. <laughs> and I can send you a link Great. if you give me your email. Yeah. <laughs> it's good. We're not the public broadcasting union. We can just advertise anything we like. What I would like to ask everybody here in the panel now is uh, to talk about the emotions that you feel strongly, you've already done it a little bit, but about the emotions that you feel when you think of Beirut now. What's the first word that comes to mind? I want to cry. <laughs> Rival wants I wanna to cry. cry. But on the other side, I want to scream. And I, I, I'm, I have these two contrasting emotions. Uh, I'm a triple Scorpio, so I could get very angry, but I'm very, uh, very sensitive, you know, but, but what I feel is uh, a lot of anger because how could you do this to me? Like, I'm, I'm your family, how could you do, and, and I'm talking about the politicians, of course, uh, just so people understand, we've been a subject of a, before the pandemic and before, before the explosion, which uh, a lot of people argue it's, it's you know, it's, uh, it's done because of, uh, you know, polit the, the political uh, strife, uh, you know. But even before that, we were the subject of the biggest Ponzi scheme in history, which billions and billions of dollars were stolen from us. So again, I want to remind people that there's a lot of anger and we're not a poor nation, we're just a robbed nation. And we need to focus on that. That's all I will say for now, thank you. And it's so clear, Allah. Yeah, I just wanted to add that, yeah, we have, um, we have six guys who ruled Lebanon since uh, 1975. And these six guys destroyed the whole country. They are six dictators. So we don't have one dictator like other countries. We have six dictators. And they are the ones who are responsible, and they are still responsible for everything that we have been going through. And we cannot move forward without getting rid of these six guys. These six guys have bank accounts in Europe, in the US, in Canada, everywhere. Every single country that owns the bank accounts or the banks that still holds the bank accounts of these men is responsible also to what has happened to Lebanon. So my emotion is the anger. I share that anger. It's also numbness 
for what has happened because I still, and many others, still did not process what has happened. And I think that's why I need to go to Beirut to see it in my, with my bare eyes, but also love. Lots of love to the amount of people and solidarity that they have to each other. I feel um, so honored to be part of that place because of the people there. Because of, I have never seen the amount of ever in my life this kind of support that people give to each other in what we're going through. Because eventually we found out with the collapse of the government we have nothing but, our, but each other, to stand next to each other. In this situation where there's no government, no syndicates, no structure of a, of a country, no banks, nothing. We only have people, each other. And for that I feel honored to be part of that place. Very strong message and indeed, listen, we need to listen, we need to know what's happening and we share this kind of responsibility. Janneke, your emotions. I think it's mainly disbelief. Um, the residency, for example, where I stayed, Haven for Artists, a very important party in, uh, in the cultural scene in, uh, in Beirut. They turned their residency into a shelter now for people who lost their homes. Um, they're just doing everything they can, and um, you know, I just, you know, I'm, you know, I praise them for their, for everything they do. So I wish them all the best, and I hope people are going to donate and support them for a long time because they deserve it very much. Yeah. And that is precisely what we want to do. This shout out to you. Why have I been asking about all of these emotions? You say, well, because the next part of the program where we start digging into the dance, into the music, into all the performing <laughs> arts that are here is because we have a wheel of fortune. It will be spun by fate. And every color, every number has an emotion set to it. When fate strikes, you can only react and it is unpredictable what happens. This, for example, also in the story of the world premiere we will soon be listening to. It's been written by Saskia Venegas. It's called Medusa. The story of Medusa, which at school I learned from a rather machoist perspective. She was the one who had seduced in the temple whilst she was a priestess, Poseidon. They desanctified the temple and Athena had to punish her. That's one way of looking at it. And then the punishment was the snakes on the head. The other side of the story is, of course, which is probably closer to the truth, that she was raped by Poseidon and that it was considered utterly impossible to punish a god. So then punish the victim. It's a powerful piece. It's a world premiere. You will very soon be listening to it. However, before we do that, because we won't have credits, we won't have titles, I would like to introduce you a little bit more to the concept of what is going to be happening here. We have DJ Kraut, who will join us on the decks. We have Lucas, who you've already seen, and we don't have to ask him for his emotion because he will be playing it. We have Julia Philippens on the violin, Uno van Geel on a table of percussion and his viola. We have Marlies van Gangelen, who plays the beauties of the oboe and the harp. We have, um, there's so much here now, goodness, I'm losing it. Um, we have Laura Trompetter, on the marimba. We have Navras Altaki, who will be singing and playing on the oud. And on the place where I am standing now, you will see Mam and Jak Tiam, a tall man with a voice of the earth, and he will be playing the talking drum. Those are the musicians coming together, but performing arts are broader than that. So we are also accompanied by the voice and acting skills of Elina Havenar, we will be getting the beauty of the dance of Emily Viertaler and Mo Bojara. That all together with word bites performing as fate, spinning the wheel, bringing all of us and all of you 
from emotion to emotion. And we here together, we've set this thing up in a question of weeks. We haven't had the time to do any real rehearsing. We are going to be guided by fate and we trust in the skills that we have. We trust in each other, that we will be able to look at each other, listen to each other and influence each other. We hope that you at home will be doing the same. Turn up your volume, immerse into the sound, see what's happening because VJ Fish has also prepared some amazing visuals for you. And listen now to the world premiere of the piece Medusa by Saskia Venegas, played by the wonderful cellist Maya Friedman. 